And great to St. Petersburg Global Ministries. This is Pastor Diane Winbush, your host. Thank you so much for tuning in with us on today. Um, we want to uh, start uh, by going into prayer. And so we want to continue to, to be reminded of the, um, the war that's going on in Ukraine. Also in regards to um, North Korea and the uh, nuclear weapons that they are launching against um, Japan. We want to be in prayer for these leaders, these countries, um, that God will um, ease the, the spirit of evilness uh, towards them. And uh, we just thank God for an awesome report. We have to pray continually. Well, we have to pray. Yeah, and that's the reason why that's the reason why we're here. We're here for vessels. We're here to do what the Lord uh, requires for us to do. And that's continue to be in prayer. And so, and of course, this is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month and Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We want to continue to be in prayer for those who suffer um, abuse, child abuse, uh, marital abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse. And we want to pray for those that are triumphing and has already overcome breast cancer and those that are coping with breast cancer or someone that's a caregiver to those that are coping with uh, um, breast cancer. We want to be in prayer for um, those um, uh, individuals that are affected as well as many of the hospitals um, that, that I can name a few, especially for children. I'm a big thing on St. Jude. Uh, Children's Hospital, Make-A-Wish Foundation, La Bonner Children's Hospital, St. Joseph Hospital, St. Peter's Hospital. We want to be in prayer for these hospitals, and we thank God in advance for healing um, and uh, deliverance and setting the captive free. We do know and understand that when a person is under illness, they are captive by the enemy. This is not something that God's purpose is to make a person sick on purpose. That's not his heart. That's not his plan. And so we pray for those <clears throat> that are affected um, in those areas. We want to be praying for those and those that are that are that are just suffering with cancer in general. It may not be breast cancer. It may not be um, domestic violence. They may be going through other different things. Bereavement. You know, um, we just thank you, thank the Lord for healing across the land today in the areas of sickness and illness. Sometimes we can be mentally ill and that's also a sickness as well so we want to be in prayer and we want to continue to keep those um lifted up that are going through their heads are bowed down they're going through heaviness heavy weight and we just thank you heavily master for um just bringing resolution bringing answers to people especially those that have missing children missing family members missing loved ones we want answers to come to those individuals this week so that they can be able to have peace. You have individuals that's been, been missing for 30 years, 40 years. Um, I saw an art, article online about, I think her name, her first name is Michelle. I'm trying to think what her last name is. I don't know if it's Jackson, the lady that was missing um, over 10 years ago after she appeared on the People's Court um, segment. They have not found her body. And we want to be in prayer for the mother, we want to be in prayer for her sisters, we want to be in prayer for people that um, have missing loved ones. They just disappeared off the face of the earth and the individuals do not know where their loved ones are. And we're praying for the colleges, the universities um, there too. Um, there was a, um, a fatal issue that occurred, I think where the, the uh, college student had um, fatally wounded um, their roommate and what have you. And we want to be praying for the minds of the people that God will put the right person on, and the right people in the same room, pair them up the right way. Um, you know, whether it's religion or their it's race or whatever, just pair them up so they can be able to get along, walk in peace, get their studies done and get their studies done in peace. Okay. So today we're going to continue in the book of Samuel chapter 17, and this is 1 Samuel chapter 17 that uh, we have been discussing about um, Saul and his disobedience, and God removed the throne from him in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we know that in uh, chapter seven, in 16, uh, the prophet Samuel goes in and he anoints um, David and what have you as to be king but David does not take the throne. He serves first. And that's uh, something that we want to be able to um, highlight in this program on today that 
uh, before we are any type of leader. God will put a servant's heart on us, at, you know, before. So that will tell you right there about your calling, a person's calling, another individual's calling. God is not going to put a person in authority unless he first knows how to serve. He has to be trained how to serve. His heart has to know how to serve others. They have to know how to pick up uh, something off the floor when everybody else misses it, misses it. You know, they make good choices. They make wise decisions. So you have to know how to serve first. So first of all, David served his father by being a shepherd to the sheep. And then here you have him serving Saul as an armor bearer. But Saul doesn't know yet that David has been anointed to take his place. When he finds that out, that's when the rocks are going to start to fly. So we're going to start with chapter 17, verse 1. It says, now the Philistines gathered together and don't think by any choice that God did not set it up this way. He has to try us before we take the throne or before we take, um, uh, you know, and, and we'll talk about that later about, about thrones. Thrones is, are just not a person that are, anytime God promotes you, that's a throne. That's a throne he's given you from heaven down to earth, okay? And that's a different topic, so we're not going to get into that. Now, the Philistines gathered together. Now, and I'm going to finish what I was going to say. Don't think that God did not know that this was going to come up in, in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, simply because of the fact, not only do we have to be a servant, then God has to try us. We have to go through something, and that's where a lot of people miss it. They don't want to go through anything. They want to say, I'm a minister, I'm a pastor, I'm an elder, I'm a bishop, I'm an apostle, I'm a pastor, I'm a usher, I'm all of these things, but I don't know how to serve. No. No, no, you got to know how to serve first. Now the, the Philistines gathered together their armies in battle and were gathered together at um, Shokel, which belonged to Judah. And Judah was one of the uh, sons of Jacob or Israel and pitched between Shokel um, or Shokah and uh, Ahazakah in Ephesdemum. Okay, these names and these syllables. <laughs> Verse two, and Saul and the men of Israel, Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. So here is Saul going against the giants. <clears throat> Some of them were giants in the Philistine camp. And so um, here's a, a war that comes up and a battle between them. Verse three says, and the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. Now we know that, um, I guess today we do do war a little bit different, but they, this is them having war back in the Bible days. So, you know, we said, well, you know, it's going to be the end time because it's going to be wars and rumors of wars, Well, that's one of the elements of it. But as we see right here in this book, that there were wars going on back in the Bible and what have you, only a distinct person that has has a I guess a um a personal deep relationship with God they can determine the differences between you know his coming well it's you know a lot of people say it's the end of the world and what have you and and this this got to be it yeah but you know the people got to get the knowledge and stuff first that's one of another element it's just not just the rumors of wars and these catastrophic events there's a lot more to it than that okay are we in the end times of course we are okay and the philistines stood on on, on one side of the mountain and israel and israel stood on the other side of the mountain and there was a valley between them. So it's a valley in the middle and one heel on this side, one heel on that side. Verse four, and there went out a champion out of the army of the Philistines named Goliath. See that? Here, here he come right now. And um, of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So he probably was normal, probably 10 feet, 12, 13 feet tall. And he said, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head. So the reason why they wore, wore brass and things like that is to protect in case of somebody shooting darts or shooting bow and arrows or whatever type of um, weapons that they had. His head was protected. They put on breastplates. Most of the kings did so they would not get injured in the battle uh, because the breastplate, of course, if someone throwing a, throw, throwing a dart at you is not going to pierce you because... Um, 
you have something to protect you, okay? So this was a physical breastplate that they wore, physical brass helmet that some of the individuals wore. And when God tells us to put on the whole armor of God, that's our spiritual breast, breastplate. Put it on, you know, and how do we put on a spiritual breastplate? Through building yourself up through hymns, songs, the word of God, reading, prayer, and fasting. That's how you put that's how you put it on. When an issue come up, just go in there and just put it on. If something go happen all of it uh, of a sudden, you just go in there and put it on through prayer, through fasting, through praying, through praising, through worshiping God. I have to go to church. You don't have to go to church and stuff in order to worship God. You can worship God at your house. It starts at the home first. And then when it goes to the church, whatever, you know, church that you attend and what have you, but it starts on the inside of you first, you the church first, and then you go to the physical church, okay? And so it said, um, and the weight of the coat was five, okay, verse five says, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, so he had something strong to protect him. Now, if he's, you know, I don't, I'm not for sure, he said, I'm pretty sure he was taller than normal height, you know, probably like I stated, probably about from between nine to 15 feet tall. But if he's a tall individual and, you know, why are you wearing all these protecting gears if you're so tough? Okay. We're going to find out he was not as tough as what he thought and what others thought he was. Verse seven says, verse six says, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. He, he was covered all the way. He had all of this iron on, all this steel on, all of this protection on. In case anything came up against him, it could not harm or touch him because he was fully, fully covered. Verse 7, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's uh, head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Verse 8, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Meaning, what you coming up here for? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. So that's what he was doing. He was bluffing him. Mister. What you coming out for me for? Don't you know I'm a Philistine? I'm, you know, got all this stature, got all this weight on, and y'all not afraid to come, to come up to me? Okay. Verse nine. And if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. And if I prevail against him, and kill him, then ye, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. So he was a um, quick pro quo, so to speak. He's offering one thing to the children of Israel, and if the Israel, the children of Israel accept it, because they were afraid of him, they was afraid of Goliath, and so was Saul. Okay, but you, but here he is making a deal with them, a bargain. Uh, verse 10 says, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. So he's telling them, y'all don't have to, all of y'all don't have to be included in this. All Everybody else can go home. Just send me one person out that can be able to defeat me. And this battle is over. We, I don't, I don't need all of the people of the Philistines. Neither do I need all of the children of Israel that's on the other side of the mountain. It's just going to take just one person. Once I knock them out and you give me, according to what this bargain I just made you, this battle is going to be over. He was strong in his, his he, he was very confident that he was going to win in Goliath. Verse uh, 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were uh, scared of him. 12. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. 13. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of these three sons were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. So here you got Jesse's three sons going before um, Saul because they wanted to go out there before him, okay? 14, and David was the youngest and the three eldest followed Saul. 
15, but David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep to Bethlehem. So he didn't pay no attention. 16, and the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. <clears throat> That's a long time. 17, and Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of his parch, this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and, and look how that the bre thy brethren fare and take their place. So the, uh, David's father was sending him as a running running an errand because they were, you know, 40 days in the valley about this war. They were drawing nigh to each other. Nobody had not done anything. No one had made a move. It was just a lot of bluffing because if Goliath was all as what he thought he was or what he was supposed to have been, seemed like he, him and the, and the Philistines would have, would have been able to take the children of Israel, Israel out just like that. But nope, it didn't go like that. Okay, so here's the father sending him um, to the brothers, to his older brothers, to give them cheese and food and different things to be able to comfort the brothers while they were in um, the valley, waiting on Goliath or the Philistines to make a move. You're right. It says, now Saul and they, um, Verse 19, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel went in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So now here it comes, the fight. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. So he did what his father told him to do. He went in there and put someone else on his job of tending to the sheep while he run the errand for his father. 21, for Israel and the Philistines had put in put the battle in array, army against army. So they was ready. They was in there fighting. 22, when David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the battle and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Goliath, G Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words and David heard them. So here David coming in, giving his brothers the food and whatever else that the, the their father, Jesse, had told him to deliver to them. And here's Goliath coming right up in the middle of the conversation. And all the men of Israel, verse 24, when they saw the man fled from him and they were so afraid. So they took out the running when he come out, Goliath. 25, and the men of Israel said, have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. <laughs> so they still making bargains. Verse 26, and says, and David spake to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the approach from Israel? So David was more concerned about removing the fear from the children of Israel to bring peace, to stop this war, to cut out all of this mayhem that was going on that the Philistines had created against Israel. Okay. And so, of course, just like I stated before, God knew what he was doing from the beginning. He wanted to show Saul, first of all, guess what? Now, I've replaced you, but you finna find out who I replaced you with. And the things that you use to fight people with, I'm finna send somebody to you that's gonna fight with less tools and with less raiment, with less guarded, uh, 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 with garments and armor, and he's gonna kill this man dead. God already knew what he was doing in the beginning. So for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So he, this David already at a young tender age had respect to God. And so he was sending a question, who is this man coming up trying to come against the children of Israel and bring a, um, you know, we have individuals today that, you know, they stand for the bloodstained banner. You know, they stand up for God. They take up for God. And that's exactly what David was doing. 
27, and the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. 28, and Eliab, his eldest brother, David's oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David and said, Why camest thou down hither? Meaning, what you come over here for? And with whom thou has left these few sheep in the wilderness. So you, who is you coming and you don't left your sheep and who, who, who did you leave the sheep with to come down here and talk to us? The, the bro oldest brother was scolding him. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart for thou art come down that thou might see us the battle. 29 and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause so mean in which you accusing me for? This is David talking to his brother Eliab, his oldest brother. Now, what have I done now? So apparently they have always accused him of doing something. You know how sometimes parents would do that with their children. They will accuse the wrong child of always doing something. You know, you can't never get nothing right. You're never going to be nothing. You ain't about nothing and you ain't going to never amount to nothing. This is what these brothers were doing to David. They had David tending the sheep. And, you know, as a child, that was a custom. But then just because he comes down to this war, what you coming down here for? Okay. And apparently the brother may or may have not have known David's strength and what he could be able to do. And perhaps maybe the brothers wanted to try to get the credit for it instead of David. Okay. Verse 29, and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Every time you come to me, it's always something I'm doing wrong. 30, shut up, oh, and he turned from his turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said unto Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of thy servant, because of him, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Okay, so here's David going to the king because, you know, you have to do things in order, right? The scripture teaches us that in the New Testament, let everything be done in decency and in order. God has an order in heaven. You, you can't just walk up to God just any kind of way where the veil was ripped. It was ripped. It was ripped. For, uh, it ripped and, and things and, and tore because of, you know, it made access for us to be able to come in to uh, um, um, have access to Jesus Christ anytime we get ready. OK, but there was still order even in heaven as to how things go. You God just don't respond to you. OK, the Holy Spirit resp responds from whatever God gives him. And then the Holy Spirit brings it through the Archangel Gabriel and the Archangel Gabriel brings it to you. Look in the book of Luke, chapter one. OK, when he came in and he talks to um, uh, Zachariah, John the Baptist's father. Okay, God don't do anything unless it's in order. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight. Okay, and uh, 33, and Saul said to David, this is Saul the king that has lost the throne. And David becomes his armor bearer. Okay, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, you're young yourself. And he a man of war from his youth, okay? So meaning Goliath had been fighting years longer than David had. David was younger and, David, and Goliath was older. 34, and David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his, and David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father chief. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of the mouth, out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. So here David is explaining to King Saul, well, he wasn't king, but he was over the people, but he was no longer anointed. Well, he was king, but he was demoted. His anointing was taken away from him. He was still in authority. I just, I'm hearing something right there from the Holy Spirit. He was demoted, his anointing was taken from him, but he was still in rulership as king over Israel. But here's David trying to explain to him his, his powers of what he can be able to do, his strength, um, basically. 36, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear and his uncircumcised, and this uncircumcised Philistine should be as one of them. 
seeing that he have to de have defiled the armies of the living God. 37, David said, moreover, the Lord have delivered me out of the paw of the, of the lion and out of, out of the paw of the bear and out of the, and, and will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. So apparently whatever David had told the King Saul, it impressed Saul and Saul released him. So you had to ask for permission. Like I said, just like we supposed to be asking God for permission and things that we do today, everything. When we making big steps and decisions and things like that, we always, I want to buy a car, get permission from God. I want to buy a house, get permission from God. I want to get married, get permission from God first. I want this new job, get permission. I want my shift changed on my job. Get permission from God first because God can protect you when you're going from shift to shift on a, on a job and God will put people in place to already be there to care, tender for you and help you. You got to always ask permission. Yes, you do. We don't do it because we're laid down in this type of, you know, comfortable type of, Christianity where, you know, once saved, always saved, and I've been saved all day long and no evil have I done. Those type of doctrines will not work and stand any type of weight in the kingdom of God. At the end of the day, you still got to give before God. So 39 and 38, and Saul armed David with his armor and he put an helmet of brass upon his head and he armed him with a coat of mail. So here's the king putting all of the things on David, what the Philistine had on him. You know, all of this iron and brass and different types of um, uh, protection so he would not get hurt. So Saul loved David, but he did not know that David was going to take his place. Okay, not yet. And David, verse 39, and David girded his sword upon his armor and he uh, essayed to go for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. I ain't proved it. I ain't got before God. I ain't asked God, could I wear all of this stuff? And God didn't tell me I had to put all of this thing, all this stuff on to be able to fight this. You know, I don't went out there and fought lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. And, <laughs> and I didn't have no raiment and armor on then. I didn't have on all this brass, this helmet. I didn't have on none of these things. But God still gave me the strength to defeat these animals or carnivores or whatever, however you want to pronounce it. 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had had even on a script and his sling was in the hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So we're going to stop right there. We're going to stop right there. We're going to pick up next week on verse 41. So thank you so much for tuning in with us today uh, for the broadcast. And we thank you for um, 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 sharing with us um, on this word on today. And we're going to be back with you next Tuesday in regards to uh, some of the other elements of David and Saul. And so we thank you once again, and you have a wonderful day and continue to be in prayer for everyone.